feel, feel like laughing with you too much. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in the head off. Oh, you put some in my tea. Right, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> no, I just laughed, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right. Hi, folks. Um, we're having a Bible study now, a sermon uh, by Mark. Um, thanks for coming yesterday. And uh, we're joined by um, Mark's wife called Claire, and uh, we're just going to have a little uh, sermon and then have a little discussion afterwards. So, um, over to you, Mark. Okay, so we're reading from John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And this is entitled The Leadership of Jesus. Are we, are we going to pray after this or before? We'll pray before. <coughs> Dear Lord, thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your salvation in Jesus. Thank you for your forgiveness and love and mercy and grace. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we just invite you, Holy Spirit, now to speak to our minds and hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So John chapter 10, verse 1. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, when he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will not by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the dog of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. <coughs> I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. We're going to concentrate on verse 10. Read verse 10. I'm going to go into the context. Verse 10. Jesus says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Chapter 10 runs through from verse 1. And it goes all the way through to verse 42. We've just read the first 18 verses. But chapter 10 of John, it's set in the context of the festival of the dedication called by the Jewish name Hanukkah. And Hanukkah was a winter festival that celebrated the rededication of the temple. What had happened is 200 years before Christ came, Two Greek soldiers captured, captured the Jerusalem temple, took all its treasures, 
and spread pig blood on all its walls and made it unsuitable for public worship. And two years after that, there was a, a Jewish revolutionary called Judas Maccabeus. And he led a Jewish army and reclaimed the temple and they rededicated it to God. <coughs> the spiritual and the, the political leaders of Israel were also meant to be shepherd of God's people. And God had warned Israel to be faithful to them. And if not, they would get exiled from the land and they would lose the uh, Jewish freedoms. Um, and at this festival of Hanukkah, where Jesus is, the priests would re-examine their commitments, but they do it in light of Ezekiel 34. So when Jesus is saying this sermon, he's got Ezekiel 34 in mind. And in Ezekiel 34, God tells Ezekiel to prophesy against the leaders of Israel. Because the leaders of Israel, they were meant to care for God's people. But instead of shepherding God's people that abused and exploited them, instead of protecting them, they'd um, led them down wrong paths and wrong ways, away from God's law. And God promises in Ezekiel 34 that he's going to send a true shepherd, a shepherd after his own heart. And there's other references in Jeremiah 21 verses 1 to 4. Jeremiah 25 verses 32 to 38 and Zechariah 11 mention the same thing. So in this chapter, in chapter 10, Jesus is affirming the fact that Israel had in the past and was now being led by false shepherds who drew them away from the heart of God in contrast to himself as the good shepherd. So the false shepherds of Israel that appointed themselves but Jesus was the good shepherd who had been appointed by his father. So verse 10, Jesus says this, The thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. There's two meanings. The historical context in Jesus' mind, the thief is actually the Roman leadership of the day. The, Jew, the Roman and the Jewish leadership of the day. So that's the historical context. But in the spiritual context, the thief is Satan. So the, the Pharisees and the Romans had been inspired by Satan and they were the wrong leaders. They weren't the leaders that were raised up by God. They weren't shepherding the flock of God like God wanted his people to be shepherded. So the, 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 the leadership, the thief, was the Romans and the religious, the Jewish leaders of the day. They were the false shepherds that Ezekiel talked about in chapter 34. So Jesus equates the Jewish and Roman leadership to the false shepherds of Ezekiel 34. And Jesus was saying how the, how the thief, the leadership, comes to kill, steal and destroy. But in contrast to Jesus, he was the good shepherd who came to liberate them from this corrupt and bad leadership. You see, leadership was meant to give people life. Instead, the leadership had been giving people death. Leadership was meant to empower people. This leadership was disempowering people. Leadership from God was meant to bring about justice. This leadership was promoting injustice. So instead of bringing fear to people, the leadership, the Jewish and Roman leadership, it was bringing fear. Instead of bringing relationship, it was bringing division. Instead of positive growth and change, it brought uh, boredom and staleness and oppression. Instead of bringing life, that had brought death. So Jesus was saying, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, when he says, I have come that they may have life, Jesus was saying that his leadership, this is to put it this into contemporary language, Jesus is saying, my leadership brings the opposite of everything the other leaders have brought so far. The leadership I bring is the shepherd leadership of God's heart. And 
John Maxwell, the, the relationship expert, says everything falls, everything rises or falls on leadership. And every problem in society is traced back to ineffective leadership somewhere. And we're living in a fatherless generation. We're living where single mothers is at an all-time high. That is the norm. There seems to be no good, no good, strong moral leaders anymore. Well, this generation needs strong voices and a return to some good, strong holiness preaching and a restoration of the fear of God. So what we're going to look at is Romans 10.10. 10. What does life look like? What does the Christian life look like or the Christian church look like when it's being governed under the leadership of Jesus Christ? So the first thing is living life to the full because Jesus said come that they may have life to the full or more abundantly. Living life to the full under the leadership of Jesus is a life of healthy, authentic, and diverse relationships because it's all about relationship. First, your relationship with God, and secondly, your relationship with your neighbours. Those two go with the two commandments to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbour. Selwyn Yu says the most important issue in the universe is that of relationships, and that's true. It must start with a relationship with God. Where are people with God? Where are you with God? Do you have peace with God? That is the most important question anyone can hear. Are you at peace with God? Are you burdened by your sins? Have your sins been forgiven? Have you experienced new birth? Are you, do you know you're going to heaven? These are ultimate questions. But they then questions get addressed through a relationship with Jesus. And I just want to say that healthy, authentic and diverse relationship, it doesn't necessarily mean that all your relationships are intimate with everyone. With You know, you might have a few close friends. Um, sometimes healthy, diverse, diverse relationships means you, know, you have a limitation to some of your relationships. Um, it also means people aren't perfect and we don't expect them to be perfect but we love them um, sometimes you can it's best to love some people from a distance because some people can steal your time, energy or emotions um, loving others sometimes is limiting your time with them because you can empower them more that's sometimes how the best are empowered. Charles Dickens says, No one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of another. So there's many, many ways we can love people. I don't know if you want to add anything, Jason. Uh, uh, I just thought uh, it was really good talking about shepherd, that leadership, shepherd is shepherd leadership and the stuff you're talking about leadership gives life but bad leadership brings death and I've never thought of it like that and uh, that if, you, if you're given some kind of leadership whether it be youth work or whatever um, you know you, 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 your leadership is either going to bring life or death so mm -hmm. the best way is to do it in a shepherd way yeah I don't know has, has Claire gone? No, she's here. <laughs> Can you say something, Claire? Um, yeah, I just like the bit where where Jesus leads us as the shepherd through all the different journey of life. So whether it be um, a mountaintop experience, whether it be a desert, whether it be the valleys, that he is the one that we trust to find the water holes for the sheep. That that we are the sheep and that we are the sheep and we'll be will be led and we'll find the nourishment that we need 
in the places that he he journeys us with, and um, just that trust involved in that, and the listening to his voice, you know, listening to the the shepherd's voice, and I just think it's a massive thing about. Um, it kind of links into the the story about the vine, about Jesus being the the vine and we the branches, in the same way that we're grafted in to the this this all this whole thing of the Jewish nation. It just stands out to me about that as well that the kind of the Jews and the Gentiles are kind of taken on part at the same level in this bit as well for me that um, from verse sixteen that there will be one flock with one shepherd. He says Jesus says he. You know the sheep that you know nothing of, that I'm the the shepherd of them too, mm. and just that we're all like kind of grafted into this one vine. We're all grafted into Jesus, and and He is the ultimate leader. He is the ultimate head, and and shepherd in that respect. And yeah, just like the the good shepherd, not a bad shepherd that won't be like a hired hand, that. How many leaders today are acting like hired hands for the church? That the first sight of yeah. issues that come up or attack, that they're going to run and leave their people. Yeah. And um, how many are willing to to stick around to stand between danger and the sheep? Wow. How many are, are Jesus actually calling to do that? Yet we're leaders are acting more like hired hands than than a true representation of a shepherd heart that God wants us to have. Mm. That's great, that Claire. Fantastic. I read a quote the other day that said, If you give people permission to feed you, you also give them the power to starve you. And um, I was I was thinking in the context of what does what does that mean in the context of shepherding? And I thought, well, sh biblical shepherding it's about it's about pointing people to Christ and not yourself because um, people look to you for leadership but there can be a danger where you you can make yourself sort of um, bad, le bad you see good, good leadership does not make itself irreplaceable mm. Mm. And there's a difference between, um, I think, shepherd in the, in the biblical point, shepherding people, yeah. is getting people to look to Jesus, yeah. and not so much the shepherd, mm. because it's Jesus who is the ultimate shepherd. Yeah, definitely. Um, but when I read that quote, it was confusing, Jay, because... It, it was sort of, the quote was sort of saying that, you know, some leaders, they, could, they play power games. And our experience is, if, if, if you're a leader and you're leading people under you and, and you, know, you know the people under you have their own agendas or their own dreams or visions or something, you know, yeah. and you, you have power over them or authority, yeah. You can sort of, in a sense, control, con not control them, but direct them in ways. Like, for example, if it, it, it's a, what the quote was saying is, if um, if the follower looks too much to the leader, it it can sometimes get dangerous because if the leader has that much power, where the follower is reliant on the leader so much. Mm. It's like you say, you know, if, if you give someone permission to really feed you and encourage you and you just take everything in, then you also give them the permission to, to, to not feed you. So it's about, um, I don't know if I make myself clear, but um, what I'm trying to say is I don't, I don't think biblical leadership is that model. A good leader wouldn't do it anyway. A good, a good leader wouldn't play on um, other people's emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Like even if he knows the agendas of people, he's not. You know, they're not. They're not going to play games like that. Because mm -hmm. I was thinking about this myself. I was thinking, you know, is 
being a shepherd of God's people, when we shepherd, when we call a shepherd of God's people as a, as a pastor, there's always that danger that they might look to us um, and and in ways where they should only be looking to Jesus, you know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. the shepherd, you, you're leading them in a sense, but you're leading them towards Jesus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then. And a good shepherd would never do that. A good shepherd doesn't have an agenda, that's the point. Yeah. I read a quote that said that good leaders don't make followers, they make more good leaders. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing, that, that we're not called to, to just bunch all these followers, that, that we're like Jesus to, to make disciples. Mm. And part of that the disciplehood is, is to go out and make more. Yeah. You know, to, to do that and to not have people looking towards but to turn to Christ themselves and the, their own relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And to keep in the vine themselves mm -hmm. yeah. and always directing them back to God rather than to us and depending on us but to depend on Christ. Yeah. You see, I, I think the sign of bad leadership in me is when organisations have a leader at the top or even a church. Yeah. And there's a fear that if that leader's not there, the organisation or the church will sort of fold or crumble. Yeah. It's like this, if we don't have him, that's it. Yeah, yeah. You see, that's not an example of good leadership because good leadership retires itself. Yeah, yeah. Because it leaves a legacy and it raises others up. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, so... I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to think what is... What is a good leader, and and encourage that, and look at it, you know, not just what is a bad leader, the sign of a bad leader. What is a sign of a good leader? What do they do? What do they encompass? Yeah. Like Christ, and but again, yeah, the same way to to constantly do yourself out of a job. Yeah, yeah. To constantly create growth. Yeah. For yourself and the the people around you. Yeah. I, th I think yeah. there's a couple of dangers. Like you, you can get people who build build little empires where they feel they have to be in control, and mm -hmm. then you get leaders where they almost abuse people. Where they f they they feed off people. They feed off their intimacy. They want a little clique around them um, who they can be intimate with. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the end. It's all about Paul when he was in uh, prison in, Phil in the Philippian church and he wrote to the Philippian church. You know, he, he was, all he thought about when he was in prison is Christ. He was just on fire for mm. Christ. And mm. if, we, if our focus is on Jesus and our love for Jesus, then we're going to have the right attitude. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2 it talks about you know, our Lord, uh, he says, you know, he thought he'd not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And Paul gives that that hymn there, or, or creed, uh, as a model of how we should be. And if we focus on Christ and are on fire for Christ, and, and model our lives on Christ, then we should be, that should flow out in our leadership. But so often we, we're just not focusing and passionate about him. Mm. We're, we're, we're either focusing on um, human things like uh, in leadership it's a very lonely place as you, as you both know and um, the tendency is uh, you can use then leadership to manipulate people where you might want to be close to people so you uh, allow certain people to, to get close to you because you can feed off their intimacy um, there's power struggles within leadership and you get focused on them, the, the problems in leadership, you get focused on that. But in the end, if, if, if you're genuinely in love with Jesus, everything should fall into place. But if, you, if you're not in love with him, then you get, you get your eyes go on all these secondary issues. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the classical leadership texts for me that that is the nail on the head. Is where Jesus says to disciples, and I can't find where it is, but he says, you see how the Gentiles and the rulers like to exercise authority? Yeah, yeah. 
And he says, not so with you. He says, uh, the greatest among you must be like uh, the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. Mm. So he totally turns it on his head, turns it round on his head. He turns the, the concept of leadership round on his head. Mm. And um, But it's powerful. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful uh, thought, isn't it? I think I think it's important because um, Henry Nouwen wrote a book on he's wrote a couple of books on leadership, but he wrote a book with a similar title to what your yours is this this message, uh, and he was talking about there's a crisis of identity amongst leaders, especially pastors and vicars, because they don't know where their role is because secular is society has become secular and a lot of people aren't interested. Uh, they don't know where they fit in, and the danger is, um, is these things that you've been talking about. The danger is that because they don't know where their identity is in 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 today's society, that they try and seek their identity in things that that are not helpful, like uh, controlling people or um, you know various issues that you you've mentioned and probably will mention in this video. Um, and um, that he was saying in his book what you were saying, and he was saying that you know loving people and stuff like that is is what what our identity can be in ministering like Christ, mm. uh, and that will always appeal in any society, no matter how secular, that uh, a minister or a leader that is is a servant and, and willing to love people and go the extra mile for the flock will always appeal to people. Yeah. The, the other danger as well though is is we leadership does have authority uh, and so uh, you know Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, he was very tender and very gracious in his leadership but when it, when it came to the crunch he did um, he did make sure that people knew he was an apostle when it needed to be and I think there's another side to it that we are shepherds but we're not doormats in the sense that leadership you know if, if God has given you a specific role of leadership then you mustn't be timid in it I mean Paul uh, Timothy was timid uh, and the Lord Paul had to tell him you know we have power and have a sound mind and not to be timid. So if you've been given a role by God to do youth work or pastoral work, you to do it as a shepherd. But shepherds aren't cowards. Shepherds aren't timid. Shepherds had to defend. Had to defend from wolves. They had to defend from lions. They had to defend the sheep. Mm. You shouldn't. You shouldn't be. Uh, you shouldn't be uh, timid if God's given you work to do. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So the second thing is, living life to the full of the leadership of Jesus is a life that embraces growth and change. So good leadership helps people to embrace growth and change. And Jesus tells that if we abide in him, we will be fruitful. We will be fruitful. And I just put, people don't like change because it involves taking risks and taking a step of faith. You know, um, Jesus will encourage us to get out of the boat, to step outside your comfort zone, um, to, and to take risks. That's what good leadership does. It, it inspires faith in people to step out. And in one of the books of Moses, I think it's Exodus, I don't know if it's Exodus, but I've got this verse here. The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn, take your journey, and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighbouring places in the plain. Say, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give to them and to their descendants after them. 
Now at this point, it's, the Israelites had spent 40 years in the wilderness, right? Mm. And the promised land was only a 40 day journey. And had spent 40 years in the wilderness. Mm. They weren't growing in, they weren't embracing growth and change. They were just, they were just complaining. And God says this, you know what he says, he says, you have dwelt long enough at this mountain. You know, we can dwell at mountains of fear for a long time. Mm. Depression, anger, rejection, addiction. Well, God might be saying to, to some people tonight, you've dwelt long enough at this mountain in your life and it's time to embrace growth and to embrace change. And um, changing growth, it's an, it's an attitude of faith and an attitude of the mind. Mm. Do you know, I, I got a shock about a year and a half ago. I walked into um, a place where I used to work before I came to Manchester, before I came to Nazarene Theological College. I left, I left this place I worked at in 2005. And I went in about a year and a half ago. And um, it was really strange. It was like a deja vu because as I walked up the aisle, I seen two colleagues that I used to work with when I was there mm. nine years nine years ago, and it was like they were the same. It was like they'd been in the time walk, mm. and they looked the same, and and they talked the same. And I had all this history and these experiences, and it was like going to some museum. Yeah. It was just really, really odd. Yeah. And um, I, f I actually felt something. I don't know what God was teaching me through, but it was sort of scary in a way. Yeah. Um, change does not always happen overnight, though. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 2, uh, 7.22. When God's talking to the Israelites about driving out the uh, the enemy nations, yeah. He says, "And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you, little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you." Yeah. So God says <clears throat> He's going to drive them out little by little. Yeah. You know, so change and growth. God's not asking for a change in growth that's going to be fast necessarily. Yeah. He's just asking for a willingness. Uh, and the reason God did it little by little is because if if God just drew, drew all the enemies out straight away, yeah. these guys would have become proud. And they'd have started relying on themselves rather than God and ended up in a mess. <laughs> yeah. The instant victory would have made them proud. And they've lost sight of God. And so that's why he drives the enemies out little by little. Wow. And I think that's encouragement, that, Claire. So we'll talk about the, the renewing of the mind tonight. Mm. We know now. I mean, after that, I've been in the wilderness since 2005. And it's now 2014. But I've been getting little small victories little by little. I've put everything in God is by invitation. Good leadership invites, it doesn't control. Yeah. Good leadership invites, it doesn't demand. Good leadership invites, it doesn't, um, it doesn't pressure. Yeah. You know, God is not a taskmaster. God is not a pharaoh. Yeah. You know, it's like in this, the story when the Israelites went to Pharaoh and complained because they were tired. He up, the Pharaoh up the load, he put more burdens on them. Mm. He made it harder. He says, oh, because you're complaining, you have this. You know, and God is not Pharaoh. Mm. Sometimes you can have an idea of, of there's a Pharaoh leadership in the church and in organizations. 
you know, there's, a, there's a capitalism that's as if the more had the Lord will not stop them mourning. Mm. And uh, you know, God is not a taskmaster. When God sent Moses to Pharaoh and he commanded Pharaoh to let his people go, Pharaoh said no ten times. God sent ten plagues on ten different occasions. Mm. So God was even patient with Pharaoh. Mm. He went back to them ten times and says, if you don't let my people go, this will happen. Let my people go, this will happen. Let my people go, this will happen. And then after the ten plagues, you know, when, when Moses led the Israelites out, he still pursued him, Pharaoh, after all those plagues. And then God in the end just finished him off in the Red Sea. But how much, how patient was God even with him? Mm. And uh, do you not have anything to play? No, that's good. So God is not God is not fair though. Mm. Good leadership doesn't put burdens on people. It lifts them. Mm. It carries the burden. So we've looked at the leadership of Jesus we've been saved so far. The leadership of Jesus is a life in all its fullness. And it's a leadership that, first of all, life under the leadership of Jesus is a life of healthy, authentic, and diverse relationships, beginning with Christ himself. Mm. Secondly, living life under the leadership of Jesus is a life that embraces growth and change. This is what it's like to live life to the full authentic relationships, growth and change. And thirdly, living life to the full under the leadership of Jesus is a life that is empowered and a life that is equipped. Empowered and equipped to do what God calls us to do. Mm. Well, we are, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're in partnership with God. God supplies the power we supply the obedience. Mm. I'll just put this, you know, in order to keep ourselves empowered, we need to accept and know our own limitations as well as our strengths. Mm. Now, I was once, when I was younger, I just, I didn't want to know about my weaknesses, I couldn't deal with them. Mm. I just wanted my strengths and I couldn't admit that, um, I couldn't do everything. Mm. Well, that's a sign of maturity. A sign of maturity is, is, is knowing your limitations and knowing that you don't have all the gifts and you don't have all the wisdom. And, that, and that's all right because we're not meant to mm. because God surrounds us with other gifted people. And um, I just put, you know, God works with setbacks sometimes. God has a way in the scriptures of revealing a vision, reversing the vision and then restoring it. So he gives someone a vision and a passion mm. and they go after God. And then all of a sudden some crisis happens in their life and they end up in some wilderness. Mm. And, the, and you say, what's happened to this passion? Where did it go? It's like the life of God in, re in reverse, but then the re God restores it. Mm. He gives you a vision and puts it in reverse to make you think he's abandoned you or changed his mind and then brings the vision to pass. You know, God gave Abraham a vision of descendants. Mm. He says, you're going to be the father of many nations and Sarah is barren and old. You know, and um, the vision looks hopeless. It says, you know, she's past childbearing. Um, and years pass before the fulfillment of the promise becomes a reality. Mm. You know, God gives Joseph a vision when he's a young man that he would be, he'd have a very significant part to play in God's plan. A massive vision. He, he tells his brothers, his brothers say, you're crazy, mate. He gets this vision, all of a sudden it goes in reverse. 
he ends up in a pit and he ends up in Egypt mm. and, he, and then he goes he ends up in prison but then he ends up a prime minister and saves his family from family and there's a reconciliation so again God gives him the vision it goes in reverse and then his, the vision is restored again mm. and the same with Jesus you know, um, Jesus comes in power of the Holy Spirit, the vision to save people from sin, and then it, it seems to the people that the vision's gone in reverse because he gets crucified, mm. and then everyone's devastated and thinks well, we thought this was the Messiah, but then God restores it with the resurrection. Mm. So there's this plan through scripture, how God reveals a vision, reverses a vision, but then restores it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how God empowers and equips us for the future. And um, good leaders recognize that's how God works with people. And God, God raises good leaders up to help sustain people. In that um, in that salvation plan, in that in that vision plan. Mm. So that's what we've been saying. Leadership is about empowering and equipping others to find God's will and God's plan for their life. Mm. Do you have anything, Claire? No, that's good. Jane. Um, I like. I I, I like two things. I like the bit about change, and I like the bit about the reversal thing. Um, never thought about that about the reversal. I thought it was really good. Uh, but God never seems to let us settle down, does He? You know, it's always a journey, and uh, uh, when we when we get too comfortable, He moves us on. Um, and um, uh, just think, thinking. Um, so yeah, we have to embrace growth and change. That's powerful. Um, I find it. I find it. I find that hard to do because I'm a bit of a. I like. I like. Uh, I don't like change. I like. You know. I like the certain types of music I like. Certain types of books I like. Certain types of food I like. And I don't mm -hmm. like change. Uh, yet it's God's way to to help us to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, in leadership, um, I think you know often in leadership you can have you can go through trials or you, you can have your heart broken uh, by people um, or may, you know maybe you've got a vision or something and people let you down and that vision hasn't been successful for whatever reason but like you said uh, if, if there's a real vision from God if it seems not to be successful uh, he, if it is a vision from God it will come back again and uh, when it does uh, you you learn from the lessons in between of what why what what he's teaching you you know there'll be lessons about your own what we've got Maybe you needed to be a bit more humble, and maybe you needed to be more patient. Uh, so yeah, they're really good thoughts, those Mark. Really, really good. Mm. So that's it, really. Um, should we close in prayer? Yeah. Do you want to close in prayer for us, Claire? Yeah, close prayer. Lord, thank you for your word, God. Thank you that Jesus is the good shepherd that the thief comes on need to kill, steal and destroy but that you have come Lord Jesus to give us life and life in all its abundance thank you that you are our good shepherd Jesus and you are our example God thank you Lord it's all about relationships growth and change Lord and about being empowered and equipped Lord thank you that you do those things in your leadership Lord help us to be good shepherds Father of your people Help us to walk in humility. Help us um, to not point people to ourselves, Lord, but to point them to you, Jesus. Show us how to do it, Lord. It's hard. Mm. 
And we just pray that you'll raise up a generation, Lord, of shepherd leaders in this context, Lord. I know it's coming, Father. Amen. Sometimes I feel there's a generation of Ezekiel 34 shepherds, God, or hirelings, as Claire said. Mm. And um, I just pray, Lord. I know Jason spoke about it on one of his videos a couple of weeks back about Jeremiah and from Jeremiah about the false prophets and false pastors. We just pray that we'll be the true shepherds, Lord. Mm. That you'll raise those true shepherds up, God. Not to point people to themselves, but to point them to you, Jesus, the, yes. the good shepherd. Yes, Lord. Amen. And help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm. Hallelujah. Okay, folks. Um, we had a couple of people come in and listen. There's one person listening now, and I want to thank that person. And there'll be others uh, listening uh, tomorrow and throughout the weeks. So for those who've been listening or who will listen to this video, we really appreciate to come. Uh, let folk know about this video. Um, let your church know about this video uh, because it'll really be a blessing to them. And uh, I want to thank Mark and Claire for what they've shared tonight. And God bless you. God is good. He's a wonderful God. It's the best thing in the world to know Jesus. And so stay close to him and uh, proclaim the gospel and live a life of Christ today. It's, he's coming back soon and we've got a work to do. So God bless you all. I uh, hope this video has equipped you and encouraged you. And uh, we'll see you again soon. So God bless. Take care now.